this next 20 minutes will comprise um, a rapid assessment, if you will, of a subset of Historic England's climate change activities, focused, as you can see, on our work in the subtitle area. And my interest in, um, in climate change affecting the ocean comes from my team's responsibility, which is to um, largely manage Historic England's uh, oceanographic data sets, I suppose, and also designated heritage assets, and to undertake research on new sites for designation and management. And of course, we've, we've seen the uh, centenary of the First World War, where we've been recording and protecting First World War U-boats from 100 years ago. So this, re this research really is to ensure that those, those U-boats are still present on the seabed for in the next 100 years. So um, going back to 2012, when Historic England was English Heritage, I did some work with our former colleague Pete Murphy, who was our coastal archaeologist, preparing, um, I suppose, prior to uh, Hannah, Hannah's work, looking at a policy document for, historic, um, sorry, for English Heritage on managing the coastal estate. And this work took really DEFRA's um, NAP, National Adaptation Programme, which, which looked at the causes and consequences that Andrew uh, discussed earlier in terms of mitigation and adaptation, and what that means for coastal archaeology. And it became pretty apparent uh, early on that all of this work was beginning to miss the oceanographic data and marine archaeology that Historic England has a responsibility to manage and allow access to on behalf of DCMS. So we began looking at um, how other nation states and how UNESCO manages, I suppose, world heritage in terms of underwater heritage. And it became pretty clear that uh, nobody was. And so, so there was a real paucity of information as to how, how to go about, I suppose, understanding, recording and collecting data for climate change in the, in the oceanographic uh, sphere. So UNESCO records World Heritage Sites for, um, largely for biodiversity in the marine zone, and you can see the background image is uh, the, the large 300km uh, co coral reef off of Belize. And it's a real, I suppose, good indicator that um, while UNESCO has this interest in managing World Heritage underwater, that is, whole, that, that is wholly focused and predicated towards um, the natural environment. So there are no subtitle World Heritage Sites at the moment. And even back in 2010, uh, you can see that the EU had a look at this um, as well. But again, cultural heritage formed part of the built environment assessment, where all, all of our interest was largely focused towards museums and the effect on flooding and inundation to museums affecting cultural heritage and tourism. So even back in 2010, the EU wasn't looking at, despite the huge coastline of the uh, European Union nations, nobody was looking at uh, underwater archaeology. So uh, then in 2011, um, joint governments produced uh, the Marine Policy Statement. And this was really uh, a, a four-nation document that, that still exists and is still relevant to set out and introduce uh, how the marine estate of the United Kingdom will be managed uh, in terms of marine planning and offshore development and so on, uh, transcontinental pipelines, oil and gas, and wind farms. And for marine planning, uh, um, climate change distilled down in, into two areas in terms of um, uh, adaptation here. So the offshore renewable sector, both uh, wind generated and uh, tidal hubs, uh, large experiments and uh, subsidies that are formerly in those areas. And also this new innovation of carbon capture and storage. And the first uh, carbon capture storage system will come online in 2020 in the North Sea. And that will pose interesting challenges for how a regulator such as Historic England reacts to new marine planning. You know, it's a whole new experience for us. You know, we, we can understand the effects of being in the environment on transcontinental pipelines. We can't yet understand the effects of uh, sub subsea or capture. So then the default then became um, what the IPCC are putting out. And so the assessment report 5, AR5, in 2013 provided the baseline for, um, I suppose, uh, oceanographic climate change, which allowed, allowed us to under, undertake our, our research. And, it, and just looking ahead a little bit then, um, oceanographic data has got a real interest and, mo and motivation for, from global partners. So you can, you can see that the IPCC are putting out two new documents, in, one in 2019, looking specifically at the ocean, and then um, AR6, assessment report number six, coming out planned in two years' time, which will allow us to, I suppose, reinvigorate and reinvestigate uh, our, our current state of knowledge. So then this distilled down into four broad principal policy areas for um, joint government, 
um, that, that have largely been covered off already. So uh, sea temperature, sea level, uh, acidification, which is really quite interesting, and we'll look at that in a moment, about how we can use that to start to manage and understand deterioration of metal sites underwater. And then uh, circulation and salinity. And then I'll look at the very end um, about whether this, these are posing positive or negative impacts for underwater archaeology. So I suppose one of the biggest challenges for an increasing sea temperature is the um, appearance of invasive species in UK waters. As the oceans are warming, it's putting our native aquatic species further north towards the cold waters of the north. And it's, we're seeing an increase in warm water invasive species in the south coast. And we're doing some work with the um, non-native species secretariat, NNSS, uh, to try to get these species recorded and understood. One of the biggest threats to underwater archaeology in terms of wooden shipwreck sites, but also wooden structures on the coast, such as uh, piers and groins, is um, the black tip shipworm, Lyrodus pedicalis. Uh, this, this is a uh, native really in, a, in, a specific, in the Pacific, not the specific Pacific, but Pacific. And uh, we think it um, came to UK maybe in a, in a bilge. So uh, when a cargo ship uh, travels around the world, it discharges its cargo. And if it doesn't pick up another cargo in a port, it takes up water in that hold to, to, to give it the, uh, the buoyancy. Uh, and then that, that hold is then flushed out when it goes to collect its next cargo. So it could be that, um, that Lyrodus pedicalis appeared in the UK um, that way from the Pacific. And you can see it was recorded on the Mary Rose 2005. And then in 2007, we recorded it in Falmouth at 50 degrees north. And then 14, it migrated another degree north in Dover. And we haven't yet seen it appear further north than Dover. But that's, I suppose, largely because we've not really been looking for it. One of the problems with this particular species, as opposed to uh, native species of shitworm, is that the um, Pacific shitworm spawns all year round, whereas our native shitworm only spawns in the summer. So the, the, the danger here is that due to, uh, I suppose, erosion on the seabed, which we'll look at, more and more ship timbers are becoming exposed and under increasing threat from spawning shitworm all year round. However, you know, looking, looking on, the, uh, on the positives of, of climate change, there is, um, we can expect in the future that we'll be self-sufficient in the, this particular shellfish, yeah, particularly as uh, Brexit's been mentioned and the ports are closed. So, so, so there you go. Uh, and this, this, is, this, is har this, is, uh, this is harvested. So wood is deliberately put underwater uh, in the Philippines to attract shitworm and then, it, then it's harvested and eaten. Uh, so uh, looking then again at uh, sea level here, I suppose the big challenge to maritime archaeology uh, is uh, a, a deeper ocean called, will cause us to spend more time underwater uh, to achieve our, our specific aims. So under, doing underwater archaeology will get more expensive because, because of a deeper ocean, we'll need to spend more time underwater you know, recording because we can spend less time through decompression. So we'll have to spend more time doing the work because we'll have less opportunity to, to do that. So one of the, the big challenges is uh, in, our, in beginning to mitigate and the cost of doing underwater archaeology will become more expensive, largely through um, sea level rise. And the, the waters are increasing through twofold. Uh, a warmer ocean takes up more room, and we'll, we'll look at that uh, in a moment. And then of course the melting of the ice causes um, those, those inundations. But then one of the, the big challenges, I suppose, for coastal archaeology is that sea level rise will cause, as Andrew said earlier, those bigger storm surges to hit the beaches so profiles will steepen, causing more erosion of the, be of the, of the beaches. But then what that will allow for underwater archaeology is more discharge into the oceans, covering up underwater archaeology and the underwater archaeological remains. So yeah, we can begin to predict that doing underwater archaeology will become more challenging because there'll be more sediments in those coastal areas. Another challenge, of course, for the, for the coast is that the um, sea level rise will bring in salt inundation, as uh, Andrew mentioned on, earlier on, and how we begin to react to that as heritage managers, where we have uh, much more salt in our coastal areas. Um, in addition to uh, non-native species, I suppose the, the next big challenge for us as heritage managers in managing protected remains underwater it is the acidification of the ocean. So the oceans are absorbing and have absorbed CO2 throughout the centuries. And of course, there's been a rapid absorption since industrialization in the 18th century. 
The absorption of CO2 in the ocean is making the oceans more acidic incrementally, so this means a lowering of uh, pH levels, and a more acidic ocean eats through metal structures faster. And this is a big, obviously, problem for oil and gas piers uh, off offshore, where they're regularly, routinely monitoring the pier legs of the oil and gas structures, which are being eaten just by the, by the very oceans that they're within. So what we're doing uh, in terms of mitigation is trying to understand that, that rate of decay, if you will. So here we are using uh, an ultrasonic thickness gauge. This is a, a piece of equipment used by the offshore oil and gas industry using ultrasonic sound put against the metal structure and recording the acoustic reflection and therefore thickness of that metal structure. So um, what we did, this is a uh, first world war U-boat and you can just see this little plug here. So the ultrasonic piece of equipment can't read through the concretion of, of the submarine's hull, so we had to clear the, the concretion away using a small chisel down to the clear steel of that original U-boat. And that, that in itself was pretty amazing to see, um, the clear steel of a 100-year-old U-boat on the seabed. So we could then put the probe against the, um, the flat surface of the steel and record the acoustic echo and therefore translate that into thickness. And then the white marker you can see is um, an epoxy putty underwater that was man that manufactured and moulded underwater and then pushed, pushed back in. I suppose one of the interesting elements of this is that um, we have to, I suppose, make the assumption that the thickness of the hull that we're measuring was built to its original specification because we can't, you know, we can't manage change unless we make the assumption from the, hull, the submarine's hull as built to its um, current level of decay now. So we can begin to model that on a graph. And, it's, and the decay has been quite rapid over those 100 years. So our mitigation response to that has been the consideration of the application of sacrificial anodes to uh, First World War U-boats. And this is, the, this is the kind of technology that comes from uh, the offshore industry, where the zinc anode of an outboard motor, for example, decays faster than the outboard motor itself. And then that anode is then replaced. So um, it, it almost kind of electrifies, in a, in a very simple way, the submarine and those electrolytes are decayed on the anode. But of course that poses a challenge because many of the First World War U-boats that we've been investigating are war graves, so we'll be applying and bolting on pieces of equipment onto a technical war grave. You know, so it poses ethical challenges in management. You know, perhaps these things might be better left just to decay and flatten over the, over the next uh, century. But in other, and understanding the acceleration of ocean acidification, there's no information at all on a global scale of the, um, the pH levels of uh, at bed level. There's been a lot of work by oceanographers to record the, the pH uh, uh, sea surface, which is where much of the AR5 data comes from, but nobody's been recording seabed um, pH levels. And we don't really know at the moment whether uh, a pH reading one metre away from a First World War U-boat will give the same reading as two or three or four metres away, or whether the U-boats themselves are having an effect on the ocean, ocean chemistry. So we've been recording with, with our uh, teams of divers um, seabed samples that have come, sea, sea water samples that have come up from the seabed, thanks, and then been recorded on the, sea, on, the sea, on the surface by this pH recording meter. So we begin to produce uh, a pH map uh, of England's uh, underwater area that we can begin then to manage change over the next um, 10 years, I suppose. One of the big unknowns, but one of the big policy areas, is the effect on uh, global climate, on circulation and salinity. We really don't know, uh, uh, as, a, as a nation, what this really is going to look like over the next 100-year period, and because of the lack of detailed projections. But what we can be clear about is increasing wave heights that Andrew mentioned earlier on, and that increased turbidity that I mentioned a, li a little earlier too. But that increasing wave heights will have a detrimental effect on beach profiles, it will steepen beach profiles, and because of um, uh, more rainfall, we'll see much more discharge uh, into the oceans, which will have a positive effect on covering up underwater archaeology, at least in the short term. But the effects really of circulation and, and um, salinity are not particularly well known. So, so just to, to cover off at the end, it's, it would seem at the moment that high negative impact on underwater archaeology uh, in terms of management through um, the increase in sea temperature a low negative impact in relation to sea level, another um, low negative impact into acidification. But perhaps, you know, just perhaps, there could be a, a positive impact in, in terms of um, circulation and salinity, bringing more of the discharge material uh, into the ocean. 
um, our, our, we also plan, I guess, um, to review the results of AR6 in 2021 in order to re reintroduce and increase our, um, our understanding of maritime archaeology and management of maritime archaeology in the next IPCC reporting. Thanks a lot.